Our world today seems to be in total upheaval. Many people are wondering if, in fact, we have not reached the biblical end times. But how can we know? Are we simply to be spectators to these events? Or have we been given information, messages that offer hope, or even help avoid these disasters? In 2004, a particle physicist working independently made a discovery that could change everything we think we know about the world we live in. Could it be that something as inconsequential as this tiny fiber contains such a message for the entire world? Have new ways of obtaining long hidden information been discovered? The emissions from a physical object when studied as a whole uniquely identify events in the history of that object. Have scientists finally discovered where to look for the secrets of the universe? And we have a piece of cloth, and uh, it leads us to a mysterious gate which opens for us, and it lets us to see a completely different world, an extraordinary world with extraordinary laws. What is this mysterious gateway? And what are these extraordinary laws that are only now being discovered? Could it be that time, space, and energy interact in a way never before predicted? Physicists are always trying to find unifying principles. Is there a unifying principle of the very, very large relativity and the very, very small quantum physics, which if we could see what that principle was, we could explain everything. Has that principle been discovered? Is modern science now beginning to decode messages that might even be coming from another dimension? Is there something on the scientific horizon that suggests we have finally been given the secrets of life itself, perhaps even eternal life? There's something which produces the order of the universe. Now, the big problem is we don't quite know what that something is. So even though I talk like we do, believe me, folks, there's a big mystery still out there waiting to be discovered. The nature of time, the creation of the universe, and perhaps even a link to another dimension. Can these great riddles of the universe be solved through the lens of the ancient past? In the next hour, you will stand at the threshold of today's most stunning scientific discoveries. Images never before seen will reach out from the dust of antiquity and touch your life today in ways you never thought possible. In a moment, scholars, scientists, and historians all come together in an amazing and unflinching investigation into the fabric of time. In a world where children grow up playing with computers and calculus is frequently part of the high school curriculum, many of the scientific mysteries of the past are today commonplace knowledge. Yet even the world's leading scientists would agree that when it comes to understanding the universe we live in and the physical laws that we think govern it, only a very few of the threads that make up this vast tapestry have been untangled. But these few threads are endlessly intriguing. Einstein's theory of relativity, quantum mechanics, particle physics, all taunt us with the notion that perhaps we can know the unknowable. Yet these studies have only begun to reveal the intricate interweaving of forces that make up the universe. Is it possible these lofty scientific pursuits are being advanced exponentially by the information contained in one ancient earthly handwoven piece of cloth? Some scientists say yes, but in order to understand how that could be, we must first understand the secrets these scientists are trying to uncover. The basic ideas behind quantum physics and relativity are really quite simple. The laws of physics are the same for all observers, regardless of where they are and how fast they're going. The universe that this model leads us to is an intelligent, self-organizing, creative, learning, trial and error, participatory, interactive, non-locally interconnected, evolutionary system. That's what it's all about. Well, that may seem simple enough to the scientists, but how can an awareness of these concepts help us understand the meaning of why we're here and where we're going? Is there some deeper understanding that can be gained through all of this scientific study? 
Why do we care about quantum physics and relativity so much? Well, basically, they're really very beautiful theories. But if that's all they were, we wouldn't care very much at all. What we feel, though, is that they're gateways. They're leading us into new ways of understanding the universe, and that we care about very much. I sincerely think that through these studies, we will come upon a completely new structure of physics, maybe even a completely different world. Science has discovered the basic structure of the entire universe by studying the tiniest possible things. And they did it with the largest scientific instruments ever built. One such instrument is 16 miles long, fills a mountain, and searches for particles a trillion times smaller than a human hair. But why? Why search for the tiniest of tiny particles? It's been known for a long time that all physical matter emits and reabsorbs particles of energy. Over 100 years ago, Max Planck named these emissions quanta, or quantum, singularly. And they have been the study of particle physics for over 100 years. And if you analyze all the emissions from any physical object, that's called a quantum hologram. We now understand that all physical objects have a quantum hologram. That study has produced a set of laws that scientists call the standard model. This is the theory that summarizes the scientists' current understanding of elementary particles and the fundamental forces of nature. In fact, what's going on in the standard model of particle physics is extremely mind-bending and paradoxical. For example, the standard model says that there are inside of the nucleus invisible particles, particles we never see on their own, called quarks. And no one has ever seen a single quark. In spite of the fact that we've achieved a lot of success in physics, there's still a lot of mystery here yet to be discovered. But assuming all of this is true, where can we begin to look for a meaningful example of what all of this means to you and me? Is it all just some cosmic Rubik's Cube for scientists to play with? Or is it possible there is a broader purpose, ancient information perhaps, that is even more relevant today? In the late 1970s, scientists developed a computer program that allowed NASA technicians to read the terrain characteristics of distant planets derived from two-dimensional satellite photographs. But the developers of this amazing device were in for a shock when they were asked to analyze a photograph of something most of them had never even heard of. Actually, what they were looking at was a two-dimensional photograph of a two-dimensional artifact. But to everyone's amazement, from somewhere there emerged three-dimensional information. To these practical scientists, it was as if they were looking at something from another planet. None of them had ever seen anything like this before. A photograph of an ancient cloth had brought the scientists face to face with the impossible. Three-dimensional information was being discovered where it couldn't possibly exist. Suddenly, a broad range of scientists took a professional interest in what had been, for those who were even aware of it, nothing more than a mild curiosity. But for one particle physicist, this tiny fiber generated the most excitement. It is a single thread from that same cloth and resting on its surface is the hint of an image that is barely visible. Could it be that somewhere in the origins of this image lay the secrets of the universe? The artifact was the Shroud of Turin, and without a doubt, it is the most picked at, probed, x-rayed, examined, revered, reviled, tested, studied, scanned, and photographed artifact in the world today. For those who are unfamiliar with this particular piece of cloth, it has long been revered as the object described in the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 6 and 7. Referring to Peter, John wrote, He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. For over a hundred years, Researchers, historians, and scientists of every variety have attempted to determine if this linen cloth tucked away in a cathedral in Turin, Italy, could actually be the one referred to 
the burial shroud of Jesus Christ. An attempt was made to discover the answer to that question in 1978, when a group of American scientists were given unprecedented access to the shroud for five intensive days. Over the next several years, this tireless group known as the Shroud of Turin Research Project, or STIRP for short, which was comprised of many of the world's premier scientists representing such diverse disciplines as physics, chemistry, engineering, forensic medicine, and many others, spent no less than 150,000 man hours studying, testing, and interpreting the data. The results seem to indicate the shroud could be a genuine first century burial cloth from somewhere in Palestine. But then in 1988, carbon dating analysis by three different testing laboratories produced quite a different result. The radiocarbon dates that we obtained clearly put the shroud uh, in the Middle Ages. According to the carbon-14 tests, the shroud came into existence somewhere between the years 1260 and 1390. Could all the other scientists be wrong? First of all, we must point out that the dating of a shroud sample in 1988 was both controversial and hotly disputed by experts in many fields. The problem of dating a cloth, not only the shroud, but I think any cloth, any old cloth is not easy to solve completely and definitely. According to the professor, the idea of a medieval origin of the shroud leads to an impossible thesis. The forger would have had to find a man to crucify, flog him mercilessly, place him in a shroud, and then manufacture or simply wait for the image to somehow appear. I think that is quite impossible that what we cannot do today, it was very easy and during a medieval period. 150,000 man hours and the work of dozens of scientific disciplines were challenged, actually brushed aside by a single carbon-14 test. But the world was left with the same question. What created the image? And how do all of these latest scientific advances lead us to this particular artifact? What is there about the image that causes scientists to put their reputations and fortunes at risk? The resurrection itself belongs to the spiritual world, and I don't think it is the business of physics to, to talk about it. However, the shroud itself and what made the image leads us to a mysterious gate which opens for us and it lets us to see a completely different world, an extraordinary world with extraordinary laws. What are those laws? And do they exist regardless of the age of the fabric? Is this purely a scientific squabble? Or could it be there is something here that is far more important than the artifact itself? Is it possible that the energy and information now being detected is actually the information we need to help us overcome the problems we face today. Are the secrets of the universe, perhaps of all creation, locked up in this seemingly ordinary linen burial cloth? Can the image, now known to contain three-dimensional information, also be a quantum hologram? Perhaps we should take a moment and define exactly what the Shroud of Turin is and what makes it so special in the minds of so many people. The shroud is an ordinary piece of hand-woven fabric that measures 14 feet, three inches long and three feet, seven inches wide. These full-length dark lines are scorches from the fire that nearly destroyed it in 1532. The diamond-shaped patches cover holes resulting from that fire. But it is the faint, ghostly image of a crucified man on the surface of the cloth that rivets our attention and makes this piece of cloth unique in all the world. What is the truth about the shroud? Is it a communication from another time, another dimension? And if so, can we determine what the message is intended to be? Could it be that the quantum revolution in physics permits science to go beyond human speculation? According to some physicists, the world is even more extraordinary than we thought. Oddly enough, this ordinary piece of linen cloth, 
that many scientists believe to be over 2,000 years old, might give scientists their most tangible clue to unlocking the secrets of the quantum hologram. Yet, some still maintain the carbon-14 test places its scientific value under a cloud of suspicion. There are hundreds of pieces of evidence, both scientific and historical, that indicate that the shroud is authentic. There's only one piece of evidence that says the shroud is not authentic, and that's carbon-14. However, carbon-14 has itself been much disputed. It is neither logical, empirical, or scientific to take one piece of evidence and ignore the hundreds of pieces of evidence in support of authenticity. We are faced with a paradox here. All of the scientific analysis seems to place the cloth in Jerusalem in the first century. But the carbon-14 test makes the shroud unequivocally a 13th century relic. What if both analyses are correct? But how could the carbon-14 tests be as accurate as modern technology can make them and all of the other scientific data that places the cloth solidly in the first century also be accurate. That possibility was suggested at the Sindonet 2000 Worldwide Congress in Oviedo, Italy. Authors M. Sue Benford and Joseph Moreno posited the notion that a 16th century invisible patch had skewed the 1988 carbon-14 test on the sample taken from the Shroud of Turin. Their idea was backed by what seemed to be solid historical research, but the whole notion was immediately rejected as being technically impossible. At this point, another scientist, one of the original STIRP team, became interested. Like others who had closely examined the shroud, he too was very skeptical of the whole idea of reweaving. The late Raymond Rogers set himself the task of discovering whether or not scientific analysis could resolve the issue once and for all. Rogers obtained samples of the shroud immediately adjacent to the area used in the carbon-14 test. These were provided by Gilbert Reyes, the man who had originally removed them. In an interview unveiled at the 2005 Dallas Symposium on the Shroud, Rogers told the interviewer, This is just about the last straw. I've got the samples that can shoot that full of holes. So I got out the Ross samples and I got out some of the, uh, the Shroud samples and I went to work again. And lo and behold, in less than an hour, I knew that, that the raw sample was totally different in chemical composition than the, uh, the main part of the shroud. And then the shocker that really shook me up in, in looking at the Ross threads, I hit this one that was an end-to-end -end splice. And that's exactly the sort of thing that Benford and Marino were talking about in this invisible reweaving. After coming to this conclusion, Ray called me one day and said flat out, Tom, there is no scientific wiggle room. Up to this point then, we can say with some degree of scientific certainty that the shroud is an authentic first century fabric. Some scientists may continue to disagree, but for the moment at least, the 1988 carbon-14 tests on the shroud appear to have been invalidated. In the meantime, a group of digital scientists in Amsterdam focused their expertise on a different set of data from the shroud. What they found stunned them all. Holographic information is encoded in the shroud in an interference pattern. And most probably, there's more information in it, which I call like a blueprint of the universe maybe an opening to a new science. You come in an unknown land. You don't have a GPS, you don't have a map. It's completely new. You have to reinvent science. And I think that is one of the things that the Shroud is all about. But even if we are to accept the Shroud as a genuine first century fabric, that's only one piece of the puzzle. Validating the age of the fabric is important, but the work being done in Holland promises even more exciting revelations. If the fabric has been proven to be a genuine first century material, could it be there is supporting evidence to suggest this very fabric might in fact be the actual burial shroud of Jesus Christ? Have these scientists discovered something in the image itself that places this piece of cloth in a tomb near Golgotha? Which brings us to the next and so far unanswered question. How did the image get there?
There can be no doubt that the Shroud of Turin has been venerated for hundreds of years by the faithful as the cloth or sheet that covered the body of the crucified Christ. Nor can there be any doubt that the Shroud exists and has been touched, handled, photographed, and examined in every way imaginable. But has the result of all the research, testing, and study brought us any closer to proving not only the age of the fabric, but the reason for its veneration? There are those who insist the authenticity of the shroud has not been proven. What's more, they contend the idea that it once wrapped the crucified body of the historic Jesus can indeed never be proven. Recently, others have challenged that assumption, and the search for historic and scientific evidence that might corroborate the authenticity of the shroud goes on. And even Cardinal Severino Paletto, the papal custodian of the Holy Shroud at the cathedral in Turin, finds the search fascinating. My attitude towards science is one of great respect. And scientists, many scientists in the world, study the shroud and carry out research, and they see what can be discovered step by step as studies proceed. And if science in the future offers us well-founded and incontrovertible elements, we will always be delighted. Pope John Paul II said that it was not the task of the church, but of the historians and scientists to define whether it is authentic or not. For a significant number of researchers, at least some answers could very well be found in a cathedral in Oviedo, Spain. In chapter 20 of the fourth gospel, uh, we read how the two disciples, the beloved disciple and Peter, ran to the tomb on Easter morning, having heard that the tomb was empty. Now, there's been all kinds of speculation as to the position of the cloths, how they saw them, but really, that's unnecessary. The original Greek text is really quite clear on that. And the other disciple ran more quickly than Peter, and came first to the tomb, and stooping, sees lying the sheets. Comes therefore also Simon Peter following him, and entered the tomb, and he beholds the sheets lying, and the kerchief which was on the head of him, not with the sheets lying, but apart, having been wrapped up in one place. What the researchers and scientists are hoping to establish is some of what modern jurists call corroborative evidence. Does the kerchief in Spain somehow match up with the shroud in Italy? Interestingly enough, the scientific studies that have been done on the Sudarium do, in fact, support the findings of the shroud researchers. For example, modern investigative techniques permit the blood stains on the Sudarium to be superimposed over those on the shroud. The result is astonishing. The stains coincide in the three main things. First of all, the blood group, AB. Second, stains corresponding to the back of the head are blood that was shed in life. There are many little stains. They were caused by some kind of sharp object that had penetrated the skin. By overlaying uh, images of the two cloths, the blood stains, the actual shape of the stains, does coincide, which leads to another medical conclusion. These two cloths uh, were used on the same corpse. It's a purely scientific conclusion. Now, if it covered the same corpse as the Shroud of Turin, well, obviously the Shroud is at least as old as the Sudarium. But setting aside the obvious similarities, there is one very important difference. Unlike the history of the Shroud, the history of the Sudarium is undisputed. And by firmly and scientifically establishing a direct correlation between the two artifacts, their value to the new quantum physics is inestimable. The modern controversy, however, didn't really begin until 1898, when a gifted Italian photographer, Segundo Pia, was given unprecedented permission by the King of Italy to photograph the shroud. What he caught on his two glass photographic plates stunned the world. The image on the cloth itself, the faint, almost ghost-like markings on the fabric, actually appeared in reverse a positive image came up on what should have been a photographic negative. For the first time in history, the likeness could be seen in full majestic detail, and the correlation between the image and the biblical description of the crucifixion was breathtaking and unmistakable. 
Skeptics and critics immediately began to cry foul. The very fact that the image so closely resembled the biblical description was, they said, proof that it was a forgery. Yet the image is so striking, so vivid, that a modern forensic analysis is possible. Dr. Robert Bucklin, a former coroner and forensic pathologist for Los Angeles County, is well acquainted with the signs of violent death. This is the body of a five foot, 11 inch Caucasian male weighing about 170 pounds. On the head, there are blood flows from numerous puncture wounds on the front, back, and top of the head. There's a swelling over one cheek consistent with a beating. The right wrist is covered by the left hand, but there's a puncture wound in the left wrist consistent with a crucifixion injury. The classical artistic and legendary portrayal of nails through the palms is incorrect because the structures in the hand are too fragile to hold up the weight of a man of this size without tearing free. There are streams of blood running down both forearms originating in the wrist areas and controlled by gravity so the blood flows toward the elbows with the arms elevated and outstretched. On the back, there are more than 100 lesions which appear to be scourge or whip marks. Historians have indicated that the Romans used a whip called a flagrum. This implement had two or three thongs and at their ends were pieces of metal or bone which looked like small dumbbells. Here you can see how those end pieces from a Roman flagrum fit precisely into the scourge lesions on the body. Here on the front of the body is a large blood stain resulting from puncture of the chest by an instrument like a lance or a spear. This weapon penetrated the thoracic cavity through the pleural spaces and into the heart. Later, after the corpse was removed from the cross and turned, blood dribbled out of the chest wound and puddled along the small of the back. There's an abrasion of one knee consistent with a fall. Finally, a spike has been driven through both feet and blood leaked from those areas and has stained the cloth. The evidence of a scourged man who was crucified and who died of postural asphyxia and cardiopulmonary failure is clear cut. The corroborating evidence, forensic, historical, scientific, and circumstantial, as the lawyers might say, is clearly in support of authenticity. The circumstantial evidence in support of the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin is simply overwhelming. In my professional opinion, it would meet the most stringent evidentiary requirements in a court of law beyond a reasonable doubt. All of the evidence, with the exception of the largely discredited carbon-14 test, give the Shroud of Turin a far greater claim to authenticity than virtually any other ancient artifact, or for that matter, any other object on Earth. But now scientists say all of this connects to the latest quantum physics. What is there about the Shroud that binds these new scientific discoveries to the old beliefs? What of the single image-bearing fiber we spoke of earlier? Does the image itself carry information? Have the secrets just now coming to light in the scientific world been hidden in this stunning artifact for hundreds of years? Could it be we have yet to learn that the universe does not necessarily work the way we have always been taught that it did? So far, we have been able to establish a scientific level of authenticity for the Shroud of Turin. And we have seen how science is discovering a whole new realm of physics. The question is, how do these two realities come together? Could it be the answer lies not with the fabric, but with the image itself? It is not simply the fact that there is an image on this piece of cloth that has so captivated the interest of scientists, historians, and theologians. It is the nature of the image that is so profound. The shroud image is made from tiny fibers that are one-tenth the size of human hair. And the picture elements are actually randomly distributed like the dots in your newspaper photograph or magazine photograph. To do this, you would need an incredibly accurate atomic laser 
This technology does not exist. According to the official published findings of the STIRP scientific team regarding the shroud image, the actual image was created by a phenomenon as yet unknown or a momentous event that caused a rapid cellulose degradation, aging, of the linen fibers. That is, an accelerated dehydration and oxidation of the very top linen fibrils of the cellulose fibers of the shroud thereby creating a sepia or straw yellow colored image similar to that of a scorch. In other words, the image was caused by something, nobody knows what, that affected only the very top of the fibrils that make up the fibers that in turn make up the fabric. After thousands of hours of intense study, the world was left with yet another scientific enigma a piece of fabric that is demonstrably handwoven containing a surface anomaly in the shape and form of a crucified man created by some process of undetermined origin. There are other striking anomalies as well. For example, it has long been known that in addition to the explicit detail of the body image, there are also other images that were somehow transmitted onto the fabric, specifically the image of flowers. I first noticed the image of flowers on the shroud in 1985. And uh, when I found what they looked like, uh, then I began uh, looking more closely and uh, found that there were large numbers of these. I uh, went and got the uh, Botany Books of Israel and spent the next four years uh, trying to identify these flower images. And by that time, I had uh, identified these, but uh, I wanted a confirmation and so on a trip to Israel uh, in 1995, uh, I contacted Professor Avinoam Danin, the world's authority on the flowers of Israel, and uh, took some of our photographs out there. When I handed the photograph uh, that I'd uh, first spied the flowers on to him without indicating what we'd actually found, uh, he uh, looked at it for about 15 seconds and said, those are the flowers of Jerusalem. He immediately knew that this was a unique finding. But once it was discovered that there were other images on the shroud, Dr. Wanger began looking closer and found that there were small coins on each eye. What significance could that possibly have? Dr. Alan Wanger, in his book, The Shroud of Turin, Adventure and Discovery, points out that not only are they there, they present distinct and profound clues as to the date and origin of the image. Father Francis Phyllis was professor of the theology as well as a, uh, a, a scientist uh, who investigated the Shroud of Turin as well as a photographer. He was working with a group of researchers who were attempting to identify uh, what the projections over the eyes were, thinking they might be coins. And uh, Dr. Phyllis uh, had uh, enlargement and made of the excellent photographs he had of the Shroud and noticed a patterning over the right eye. On enlargement of this, uh, he noticed that there were letters which he interpreted as U-C-A-I and something looked like a shepherd's crook. This is typical uh, of uh, the uh, leptin or the uh, widow's mite struck by Pontius Pilate uh, in uh, the years uh, in 2980 to 33. We can identify the, the images of them and so we can identify the particular coin and uh, know the origin as well as the date, which are both of them are, uh, that we identify are struck in 29 AD. So this uh, dates the shroud uh, back to the first century. It also localizes it to Israel since the, these uh, coins are just the widow's mites or the common penny of the time and certainly would not circulate either outside of Israel or not very long uh, after the reign of Tiberius Caesar to which they were dedicated. But how could an image containing so much information have been formed? There are those who believe the image could only have been formed by a burst of some sort of radiation. But the simple fact is, nothing like the shroud image has ever been found or reproduced. But that's only the beginning of the astounding information to be gleaned from this amazing image. In spite of skeptics and setbacks, scientists continue their search. And Dame Isabel Pitzik, a particle physicist, believes the shroud has brought science to the threshold of a whole new understanding of physics. While dealing with the position of the body within the cloth, she discovered one of those mysterious properties that cannot be, yet somehow is. An interface that divides the image transport into two hermetically separate yet simultaneous actions and forces 
causing the shroud to be taut and parallel on both sides, creating a true event horizon. In general relativity, we have found that there are certain things called black holes. Now, the surface of a black hole is called an event horizon. And it's called that because right at that surface, right at that surface, the laws of physics seem to change character drastically. When you look at the image of this rod, the two bodies next to each other, you feel that it's a flat image. But if you create, for instance, a three-dimensional object, as I did, the real body, then you realize that the, there is a strange dividing element, an interface, from which the image is projected up and the image is projected down. The muscles of the body are absolutely not crushed against the, the, the stone of the tomb. They are perfect. It means that the body is hovering between the two sides of the shroud. What does that mean? That there is absolutely no gravity. Other strange things you discover that the, the image is absolutely undistorted. Now, if you imagine that the cloth was wrinkled, tied, wrapped around the body, and all of a sudden you see a perfect image, which is impossible unless the shroud was made absolutely taut, rigidly taut. Everybody thinks that the tomb signifies death. Not at all, the exact opposite. The shroud and the tomb signifies an unbelievable beginning. Because we, in the depth of the collapsed event horizon, there is something which science knows as singularity. That this is exactly what started the universe in the Big Bang. We have nothing less in the tomb of Christ than the beginning of a new universe. For centuries, the shroud has been viewed and analyzed as a record of a death, the end of the physical being. But Isabel Pitzig is suggesting that it is, in fact, just the opposite, a record not of an ending, but a beginning, which would suggest resurrection in its truest sense. And according to Dame Pitzig, this is the starting base for the new physics. But is Isabel Pitzig out on a limb of physics where no one else wants to go? Perhaps not. Recently, a group of scientists trying to identify those things that are fundamental to the way nature works made some startling discoveries. Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, founder of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, author and lecturer, explains. The classical traditional model in physics which began in Newtonian times, uh, d describes how particles and at atoms and molecules move and recombine. Even most of the 20th century, physicists only looked at the particle aspect of it and did not really concentrate very much on the informational aspect. And it's only really with the quantum hologram that we have brought information up to a par of importance with energy itself and with physicality, so that we understand that the universe we live in not only exists because of its physicality, but it's understood because of its information. And this is a, a powerful new concept, and all physical bodies have such a holographic emission uh, that is available non-locally, which means throughout the universe, non-locally at all times. Could it be the event horizon demonstrated by the image on the shroud sent information instantaneously throughout the universe? And does this mean that the resurrection was a universal event? Physics has achieved a lot of success, and we think that we have pretty much everything, but it turns out we know we don't. We know there are missing links. We know there are puzzles and infinities cropping up all the time. And believe me, people are working to find some answers. But in spite of our successes, there are still some mysteries abounding. Some scientists believe the characteristics of the image on the shroud, such as three-dimensional information from a two-dimensional photograph, 
the negative aspect of the image, and the fact that the image that appears on the cloth virtually free of distortion are basically holographic. The quantum hologram is merely a method of describing the total emissions from an object. Very much like if you look at your fingertip and you look at one of the little swirls on your fingertip, it doesn't tell you very much about you. But if you look at the swirls on all 10 fingers all at once, that's your fingerprint. And it uniquely defines you and identifies you. The same thing with a quantum hologram. The emissions from a physical object when studied as a whole uniquely identify events in the history of that object. Could it be that events in the history of the Shroud of Turin are still there for us to discover, decipher, and understand? If the essence of physical law is informational, then perhaps the image on the Shroud has given us not only a record of the resurrection, but a description of creation as well. Could it be that instead of science proving the shroud is authentic, the image on the shroud is proving the accuracy of the science. In the quest for scientific authenticity, has the miraculous meaning of the shroud been rediscovered? What would it mean to the world if scientific research and the faith of generations could join hands in perfect harmony? Up to this point, the evidence seems to indicate that the 1988 carbon dating of a small piece of the shroud fabric was at best compromised and at worst completely useless. In addition to which, compelling corroborative evidence has been examined that places the shroud and the Sudarium of Oviedo on the same body. Ongoing research, meanwhile, has uncovered a number of other scientific anomalies that place the shroud squarely over the body of Jesus Christ at the time of his resurrection early in the first century and at the same time, squarely at the center of a 21st century scientific paradigm that suggests a new understanding of our place in the universe and how it all began. We have also seen that scientists are now coming to grips with a whole new basis of physics, fundamental to the way nature works. In one of the most exciting discoveries to date, Dr. Petrus Soons points out that there is more, perhaps much more, to this piece of fabric than meets the eye, even peering through a microscope. In 1931, Giuseppe Henri, a professional photographer, was commissioned to make a photographic record of the shroud in connection with a royal event, which meant many photographs would be taken. Dr. Soons reasoned that if the negatives of these photos also contained three-dimensional information, a full hologram of the image might be possible. I contacted Dr. Alan Wenger and his wife Mary because I knew that he was in the possession of second and third generation copies of the negatives of the photographs that were made in 1931 by Dr. Henriet, a professional photographer. He made available these negatives uh, to me and uh, I brought them to Holland and in cooperation with the Dutch Holographic Laboratory, we digitalized them and uh, if a professional looks at negatives, he can see how much information is in it. So we estimated that it would be about two to three hundred megabyte. But it proved to be that most of the negatives had information up to one gigabyte, which means four times the information that uh, we estimated. There could be still hidden in uh, these uh, digitalized files a lot of information that we still don't know about. At first glance, we might think that negatives of photographs taken some 75 years ago would be less likely to yield usable data than modern photographs. But you have to remember that the techniques used back then required much longer exposure times and more light, which means there is very likely much more information on the 1931 Henri negatives than on any of the more modern photographs. Dr. Soons took the negatives to a holographic science laboratory in Amsterdam to see if they would be willing to test his theory. So when I came there with my uh, photographs and told them there was 3D information in it, they were very skeptical about it. Because normally you don't make a hologram of a photograph. Then they started uh, experimenting and they found out that they could make a hologram of this material. 
To correctly view these specially processed images of the holograms, please use your 3D glasses. It is very important to, to notice also that uh, we didn't change any data. So all the information that is in the digitalized files is also in the holograms. What we did in the laboratory is we checked the whole shroud for existing 3D information. The only 3D information that we have found was in the image of the body. All the rest that, for example, Dr. Alan Wenger has discovered, for example, the flower images, that was a different imaging process. So basically you talk about three different imaging processing in the, the shroud. That is the blood, which was direct contact. The second was what uh, Dr. Alan Wenger has found, uh, for example, the flowers. It could have been corona discharge, but it was a completely different process than the image formation of the body itself. It's important to realize that no other two-dimensional image in existence has been shown to contain three-dimensional holographic information. The whole body holograms gave us the possibility to see the image of the man on the shroud under angles that had never been seen before. We could confirm a couple of the findings, like for example the round little objects on top of the eyelids that have been interpreted as being coins. We cannot see inscriptions, but we can confirm that they are solid little objects. A point of controversy has always been the position of the legs, because you cannot see that very well on the photographs. On the hologram, of course, it shows extraordinarily well. The left leg was stretched. The foot was put in a diagonal position, fixed to the cross. And then the other foot, the right foot, was put straight in a vertical position on top of the other foot, that's why the, uh, the leg is bended, and there was used one nail to nail both feet and fix them to the cross. The hologram provided yet another surprise for Dr. Soons and his associates, one they are only now beginning to explain. The most exciting things that we found in uh, the hologram was uh, under the beard, in the neck. It was known already that it was a white line, but nobody could ever say what that exactly meant and what it was. It's a solid object. It is in the form like something like an amulet that was uh, put there. Now, after uh, studying it for quite a while, I could figure out that there were letters on it, on top, sticking out a little bit. Well, it turns out that that uh, information on that plaque is evident in some photographs and not in others. And the people at the Eindhoven Holographic Lab in the Holland found that slight variations in the focusing distance brought that information out. So on one photograph where we have this information, it was uh, just by pure luck that everything was right and they captured it. And what that, that is suggestive of is that there is inf different information at different depths into this image. And Dr. Peter Soons thought he saw letters there and he talked with a uh, rabbi and scholar uh, who is fluent in the Aramaic and Hebrew and uh, the letters are apparent and they translated in those into a, uh, a meaningful phrase which uh, says a lot about who this might be. Now these letters are ABA, Aleph, Bet, Aleph, which is the word Abba, which means father. Now seen the circumstances here and were the amulet is, that makes a lot of sense because Christ used to call himself also the Son of God, the Son of the Father, the Son of the Holy One. So it is like saying, the amulet that was put probably by the apostles over there, like saying here is the Son of God. This information is, is going to have to be checked out, but if it were confirmed, uh, this would just be along the line of several other things that have been written just recently, I mean literally hot off the press books, that are saying in early Christianity, two messages were preached from the very beginning. Jesus is divine and he was raised from the dead. Those two go, are right there at the beginning. They didn't come uh, decades later. And of course, that's the same proclamation that we find in the Gospels and in Paul. Could it be that it is possible, after all, to prove that this is not only an authentic first century cloth, but was in fact the burial shroud of Jesus Christ? But there was more. In fact, there was much more still to come. Tom D. Mahala, while examining the hologram close up, asked Dr. Soons if a single fibril from the image area of the shroud 
was sufficient for determining whether the image contained holographic information. That is, if the shroud itself was a hologram. The answer had exciting implications. First, it's important to understand what a hologram is. Basically, a hologram is a pattern of interacting microscopic rings or interference fringes, not unlike the pattern created when a handful of pebbles are tossed into a pond. Every area of the hologram sees and stores information about the whole image. If you break a hologram into multiple pieces, you have multiple holograms, each bearing information about the whole image. And that is important for the Shroud of Turin also because the upper arms are missing because of a fire in 1532. So if, what I believe, there is holographic information in the Shroud, you would be able to activate that. You would see the whole body of the bed in the Shroud, including the missing upper arms. Testing is still being done to determine if, in fact, the Shroud image does carry holographic information. Dr. Soons has already seen rings on the latest hologram of the shroud image suggesting that this may be the case. Perhaps in the not too distant future we may be able to create a full unblemished hologram from a very small area of the shroud's image. Indication of this can come from a single fibril. Having had a chance to examine the holograms, we asked both Dr. Alan Wanger and Tom DiMahala to tell us if there's anything there they hadn't seen before, to give us their impressions of the new data. The hologram does a remarkable job of uh, emphasizing the certain features uh, on the shroud. It gives a, an astonishingly three-dimensional aspect to this. It makes uh, some of the features much more prominent, uh, particularly the scourge marks that we see uh, uh, front and back are astonishingly uh, revealed in, in the holograms. Uh, also, we see certain parts of the body, uh, such as uh, the, uh, the, the toes, some of the hair, uh, and actually we think that possibly uh, one of the elbows uh, on, the, on the holograms, which are not really that apparent on the regular photographs. The discovery of the plaque around the neck is particularly significant. And being able to identify and translate the letters into a meaningful phrase suggests not only who this person was, but who and what the people of that time believed him to be. Slowly but surely, science seems to be giving us the closest thing to literal proof of biblical history the world has ever seen. There are other things as well. For example, we can clearly see there is no distortion of the dorsal or backside image. The fact supports Isabel Pitzik's theory of a true event horizon. Had the body been lying on rock when the image was formed, distortion would have been unavoidable. There are several remarkable attributes to the shroud evident here that aren't discussed very much. The most obvious is that it is still here, that it has survived through fire, flood, and the ravages of time. And even though it has presented the faithful and scientists alike with considerable challenges, it still has a message for all mankind. The more we work with it, the more we discover and the more we come to realize that this could be a record of the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ. The shroud is uh, the most astonishing uh, object that's in existence, most intentionally studied, and the one that has the most important information uh, for uh, we human beings. We have no question but this is Jesus of Nazareth, and we feel that the event, uh, which occurred approximately 30 to 36 hours after death, with the body disappearing within the folded shroud, indicates that uh, some uh, unique event, which we call a resurrection, had taken place. Probably the most uh, pivotal uh, event in history, which is exemplified and witnessed uh, by the Shroud. At least as far as the Shroud of Turin is concerned, science, once thought to be the enemy of all things religious, now seems to be enjoying a new role as partner in uncovering the truth. But regardless of the scientific, archaeological, or theological determinations, people have come to their own conclusions about the Shroud, what it is and where it came from, and the meaning it holds for them. At this point in time, it seems unlikely that carbon-14 tests or polarized light microscopes or any of the other so-called tests advanced by the skeptics will do much to change their conclusions. 
Probabilmente questo dono viene direttamente da Gesù. Probably this gift comes directly from Jesus, if we also want to say that it appeared at a certain moment of history. And meanwhile, we are not able to explain the origin of the image, which continues to be a great mystery. Un grande mistero. The shroud always remains an instrument of providence, given to the church to announce in a rather more sensitive way, also in an exterior way, that great mystery of a love that could not be greater. But could it be that the image on the shroud is telling us there is something beyond death? Until modern times, science has not concerned itself too much with how we know what we know. It's based upon information, but science has not looked at the subjective experience, nor exactly how we uh, perceive what we perceive. But this quantum holographic development and understanding is changing all of that. That helps us uh, get a new handle on how information is utilized in living organisms, something we've never had before. The researchers and scientists continue to explore all possibilities, and the Shroud of Turin has apparently given the scientific world a whole new quantum paradigm to think about. This astonishing artifact has brought to light a whole new world of scientific and religious possibilities. Is the Shroud of Turin, in fact, a physical and scientific record of what has been regarded up until now as a purely spiritual event? the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ? Could it be, as Dame Pitzig suggests, the evidence of a new beginning and the threshold of a revolution in physics that can open the door to the meaning of the universe? Or does it suggest the existence of some unknown force still waiting to be explored? For two millennia, a mysterious image on this piece of cloth has comforted the faithful and puzzled the skeptic. Now, with hundreds of thousands of man hours devoted to scientific analysis of the shroud, perhaps we can draw some conclusions. Since nothing even remotely approaching the image on the shroud has ever been found, it seems fair to suggest the image was intended to be a message to mankind. And if all of this is true, wouldn't that suggest the message of the shroud might simply be a message of hope. As each new scientific discovery enhances the meaning of the image of the shroud, it seems to be saying, look closer. I have given truth to the world. Bring it into the light. Could it be that the haunting beauty of the hologram is the final clue to the true identity of the man portrayed by the image on the Shroud of Turin? <laughs>